Hello, uh, my name is David Nutt. I am the current chair of Drug Science and uh, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about uh, why we set it up and what it does. Previous to setting up Drug Science, I was the chair of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, which is the government's advisory body on drug harms and drug regulation and drug penalties. And as some of you will know, I was sacked from that position back in 2009 because essentially I said that the British drug laws were not evidence-based and there were compounds which were rated much more severely than they, the science said they should be and others which were not even considered as drugs even though they were very harmful. And that didn't go down very well and I was sacked. Uh, that left a great gap in the evidence base uh, relating to British drug policy. And I was very fortunate in uh, a donation was made to me to set up a charity, which initially was called the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs, but which is now known as Drug Science. And this committee was set up to tell the truth about drugs. In reality, it was set up to replace the ACMD as a truly independent body, full of scientists and experts who were free from any kind of pressures from government or any other lobby groups. And over the last nine years, drug science has gone from strength to strength. We have done some very sophisticated analysis of the harms of drugs. We've developed policy documents in relation to drugs such as cannabis, such as ketamine and psychedelics. In addition, we've also put out position statements. One of the most important ones we put out uh, in 2016 was a, a position statement on cannabis, the health benefits of cannabis, and that was very influential in helping the WHO come to the decision this year that they should do a proper, full, detailed expert review of cannabis. And we're hopeful that that will come to the same conclusions as we did, that cannabis is a medicine and should be therefore made available throughout the world for a number of different medical indications. We're particularly expert in using a technique called multi-criteria decision analysis, or MCDA. We got on our uh, panel, we have uh, Professor Larry Phillips from the London School of Economics, who is the world leader in this field. We've conducted a number of these analyses, and they've been extremely uh, important in terms of educating people about the comparative harms of drugs. The first one we did looked at 20 drugs. Uh, was published in The Lancet in 2010 and has received over 1,000 citations. So it's a landmark publication in terms of drug policy and drug science. Recently, we received a grant from the Norwegian government to do a new kind of MCDA, but this time to look at the effects of different drug policies on the harms of drugs, rather than looking at the harms of drugs themselves. This was a very challenging and difficult thing to do, but it's now been published and it's already beginning to change the way in which people debate about drug policies. Because we showed that for two drugs, for alcohol and for cannabis, state regulation of access was by far the best option in terms of reducing the harms of these drugs. The way drugs are controlled in Britain is complicated. You all heard of the class system, class A, B and C, with class A being the most harmful drug and class B being the least harmful drug. The class system is there to determine the punishments which uh, the possession or the, the sale of these drugs uh, attract. Class A drugs can attract up to life imprisonment, for instance, if you're caught selling them. But in uh, parallel with that, we have a system of schedules. And the schedules relate to the availability of drugs for medicines, medicinal purposes, and the current controls which are put on those uh, medicines. So, for instance, the most harmful drugs, or the drugs which are most likely to be stolen from the pharmacy, drugs like heroin or cocaine or other opiates like fentanyls, they're put in Schedule 2. And then drugs which are less harmful and therefore less likely to be stolen are put in Schedules 3, 4 and 5. And the controls that are put on these drugs vary. So Schedule 2 drugs have to be kept very carefully under lock and key because people might want to steal them where well, Schedule 5 drugs can just be kept on an open shelf. And there are some restrictions around the prescribing of Schedule 2 drugs. Sometimes you have to write the prescriptions out in a specific way, in specifying exactly the, the number of tablets you're prescribing, etc. The big problem, though, comes with what is called Schedule 1. Schedule 1 contains drugs which are 
medicines and have been medicines for many centuries, like uh, LSD, magic mushrooms, and um, and MDMA, which is the technical term for ecstasy. And he's, by putting a drug in Schedule One, the Home Office effectively says that these drugs have no medical value, even though they were medicines. But it also says that they're very, very harmful. So Schedule One effectively collates no medical value and harm. And therefore, the controls on Schedule One drugs are, are immense. So for instance, as a doctor, I can prescribe a Schedule Two drug, heroin, but if I want to research a Schedule One drug, I have to get a special police check and a special license. The reality is that once a drug's put into Schedule One, it becomes almost impossible to research. You can't use it clinically, and to research it clinically, you need these extra licenses. They cost up to £5,000 and a huge amount of time and effort, so people don't bother to get them. Many universities in this country do not have a license to allow their st staff to study Schedule One drugs, even in the test tube or on the bench. And now we're in a circular argument. The government says, well, these drugs have no medical value because there's no research on them showing they have medical value. And the reason there's no research is because it's too expensive and difficult to do that research. So it becomes self-justifying. And over the last few years, we have campaigned very strongly to release all drugs in Schedule 1 into the research arena with the same controls as they want to have if they were Schedule 2 drugs. That way we could really accelerate research and hopefully develop good insights into the value of these drugs, which already our research has shown have promise in the treatment of disorders like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and addiction. But they could have much more wide-ranging efficacy. That will never be realised unless we liberate them out of Schedule 1. Now the purpose of banning these drugs, which actually in all, all cases were medicines until the 1960s and 70s, was to stop recreational use. That hasn't happened. The use of drugs like MDMA and magic mushrooms is still as common as it was 30 years ago when they were banned. But what's happened is that research has pretty much stopped. However, in the last few years, groups like mine and uh, one or two groups like in John Hopkins and New York University in the States have actually fought through the, the regulatory morass, the jungle of regulations and, and um, controls, and started to do some research. And these, this research has shown some really important things. It's shown that magic mushrooms can be useful to help people with resistant depression, that psilocybin, magic mushroom juice, can help people come to terms with dying that psilocybin can help people stop smoking and stop drinking, that MDMA can treat PTSD. And this tells us that we should now be putting much more effort and investment into studying these drugs. We can't do that when the current regulations conflate recreational and, and research use. We must clearly separate those. We must make it very clear to our, our governments, our uh, MPs, our representatives that Putting these drugs in a, a schedule that tries to stop recreational use is pointless in terms of because it's the counterproductive action is to stop research. So we have to work out a way to separate them to completely. And I think we can do that very easily by just saying that the drugs which might have medical value could be put in schedule two alongside much more dangerous drugs like heroin and fentanyl. That would have no impact on rec the recreational ban but would certainly liberate research to the benefit, of, I think, of, of many millions of patients in this country and worldwide. Thank you.